Hi there. Welcome, everyone. Believe in Bills, pre-Miami Dolphins edition. Adam Benini just outside of Buffalo. Sal Mayorana is in Rochester, but he won't be there for long. Uh, he, of course, is covering the game for the Rochester Democrat and Chronicle. Wheels up, Sal, at, uh, at what time? Uh, well, allegedly at one o'clock. I always say allegedly, uh, you know, Adam, because you know my travel history and I've seen just about everything that could possibly go wrong outside of a, you know, tragic plane crash. Uh, thankfully, everything else has probably gone wrong for me in the air. So we'll see. All right. As we record this uh, and we prepare to talk football, um, our thoughts are it's September 11th as we record this. And uh, I think our you know, perspective and is like so many others, uh, We'll never forget what happened that day no, and his lives lost. A- absolutely not. It was uh, it was horrendous. I'll never forget, Adam, a quick a quick story. You might have a similar one, too, because if you remember, the, the when the Bills returned to play, it was uh, in Indianapolis. They, they canceled the Week 2 game. And I'll never forget flying through O'Hare, which is one of the busiest airports in the world. And this is 11 days after the tragedy, and it was a ghost town. It was surreal to be in that airport um, for that entire trip, Go, going there and coming back. So yeah, you, you don't you don't forget things like that. And every year this is a somber day in America as it should be because of all the lives that were lost. So yeah, football takes a back seat, um, certainly on a day like today, but tomorrow football will be back in the, uh, will be back in the national conscience. That's right. And uh, the bills will be in Miami for a matchup. Now you get into the, uh, the division. Right. And so there's so much history here. We're going to talk X's and O's. There's a lot going on to to discuss here. There's the Tyreek Hill situation as that continues to evolve. Yeah, Um, we'll touch on that. There's the the nature of this rivalry, uh, which has been lopsided in recent years, but it goes way back. And you and I both covered it uh, all Mm -hmm. through the years. And I think it's it's some interesting perspective um, to reflect on as we get to a week two game with uh, a lot on the line, at least, you know, early as things go in week two, there's a lot that, that kind of is baked into uh, this particular matchup. So let's start with the, the, the bills, the four time division champions, of course, closing the regular season at Miami last year, uh, winning that game, locking up the division title. It took them until then with that win streak to end the season. Um, There's a lot of familiarity here. Uh, I expect a close, tightly contested game, but the Bills really under Josh Allen, Sal, have, have owned this team. He's 11-2 and two against the Miami Dolphins. Yeah, I mean, last year that game, it was that was the kind of game that the Bills always lost when they played Miami. I mean, we can go back in history a little bit because it's always fun for me to look back to it because I lived it as a fan in Buffalo. You know, the 1970s, they were 0 for 20. Against, against the Dolphins. It was staggering how the domination um, lasted for the entire decade. It was so neatly bookended in, you know, in all of the 1970s. And, you know, I don't know what you were, you were growing up in where Massachusetts, I believe, right? So you didn't care. I was growing up in Western New York and I attended several of the games as a fan, as a kid in the seventies. And the Miami always found a way to win Every game, the, the the funniest remembrance I have Adam, is the 1979 season opener. I'm in the end zone under the scoreboard where Tom Dempsey lines up a 35 yard field goal to win the game and end the streak. It was 18 in a row at that point. <laughs> it had been a monsoon in the third quarter. We're all soaking wet, drenched, but it had cleared up by then. He comes on the field. We're all thinking this is it. They're going to tear the goalpost down. And he misses wide right, I believe. Maybe maybe it was wide left. And we're all like, you got to be kidding me. I mean, it was unbelievable. <laughs> but then the very next year, I'm in almost the same place in the end zone when they finally break the streak at 20 in a row. And I was I didn't go on the field and tear down the goalpost. Wasn't that stupid. But I was there that day when it, it was like winning the Super Bowl. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the history is, is amazing between these teams. And through the years here, you know, it started to gradually turn in the 80s, especially in the mid-80s when Kelly and Levy showed up. The 90s, the Bills kind of did a very nice job against them. And now ever since, Buffalo has crawled all the way back into this series. They're, they're only down, I think they're five games under 500 now against the Dolphins, when at one point it was like they were like 30 games below 500 against them. So it's amazing how it's turned. And I'll tell you what, I enjoy this more. 
Yeah, from de- from decade to decade, it's uh, to hear you reflect on that. And yeah, I mean, I grew up in southeastern Massachusetts, not far from Foxborough. I mean, the Patriots had a guy named, of course, uh, Steve Grogan at quarterback, yeah. you know, back then. And there was the whole squish the fish thing um, when they had some of their success. And you think about uh, the 85 Bears and how the Patriots had advanced onto the Super Bowl and actually just got destroyed uh, with that. Uh, Mike Ditka led defense and and everything coached um, in that Super Bowl, but the, the, there was the rivalry uh, in New England through the years, but but nothing in terms of the domination and with that win streak in the seventies that you talked about, or whatever. I mean, so much had had built up, and then you get to the Kelly Marino uh, era, which just a you know classic. And I think you've written, I think twenty two books. Right. Yeah. Something like that. that. So, I mean, so much of it on the history of the Buffalo Bills. And I just think we might as well touch on this now. Um, the rivalry when the Patriots dominated Buffalo under Tom Brady, it, it kind of took a back seat. But this is what Ralph Wilson really when they wanted to realign and put uh, and take Buffalo out of the east. Right. Ralph Wilson kind of held his ground. Yeah. primarily because he wanted to preserve the Miami rivalry. This is what he envisioned late in his life and late in his ownership of the Buffalo Bills. And now I think it's come to fruition with what's been happening uh, yeah, you, in recent you, years. You remember Ralph had ties down in Miami. He, he, the, the, the Bills almost ended up in Miami. That was one of the cities that he wanted to go to when he was trying to get the expansion team. So he always wanted to stay in Miami or play in Miami when the Dolphins joined the AFL. And I think it was 66 um, he was thrilled because it was a natural for him, at least. There wasn't a rivalry for Buffalo people until the 70s when Miami started owning them. But Ralph always considered the Dolphins his number one rival, even more than the Jets, the Patriots, who were original AFL teams. It was always Miami, and it was pretty disappointing for him the way his team <laughs> sucked every year against Miami. So, yeah, things have changed. I mean, Adam, if we, if we could, you know, I'm going to branch off here. If the NFL had its way and they were to realign, they would certainly take the Dolphins, I think, out of the AFC East and put them down in a division with some of the teams in the South. Uh, but right now that's not going to happen. Everything is status quo. There's no talk of expansion that I'm aware of. So this is what it is. And you know what? It's fine because the, the Bills-Dolphins rivalry is back to being, you know, in some ways, I guess you could say it's getting close to the Kelly Marino years because you've got the two quarterbacks who are set in stone. I think Mike McDaniel is now going to be a long-term coach uh, as as Sean McDermott already is. So you've got some things in place there, and there's always the Buffalo-Miami dynamic, right? Blue collar against, you know, sure. South Beach. So that's always going to be there. All right, so as we get to this particular matchup, and you mentioned the quarterbacks, why don't we start there? Um, where, where Josh, we had Joe Rose, former Dolphin tight end, uh, who, by the way, uh, caught Dan Marino's first career touchdown pass as a, a note of trivia there. But he was on uh, Sports Talk Live with us on, on Monday night. He is the, the radio color voice, as I mentioned, of the Miami Dolphins now. And it, in the one loss column, the lopsided nature of this rivalry uh, with, with Josh Allen at quarterback, I mean, so much of their approach down there is finding a way to limit Josh Allen. And we've talked about, you know, the whole overrated discussion or whatever. Josh Allen is is one of the, and it's a short, really top elite quarterbacks in the National Football League. And I guess my point is I'm not sure that Tua Tagovailoa is. He's very good, but he's not at that level at this point. No, no, he's he's there in the salary structure because he got right. a deal. But no, he's not at Josh's level yet. And let's face it, he also has tremendous weapons, right? He's got he he has better weapons than Josh Allen does. And still, Josh Allen is the better quarterback, in, at least in my eyes, than Tua. Tua's got limitations. We know he's not a big guy. Um, he does throw the deep ball pretty well. People think his arm isn't very good, but I think he has a very good arm. And he takes advantage of that speed on the outside. Last week, they had two plays, 80 yards to the hill for a touchdown. I think a 63-yarder to Waddle. So he can get the ball downfield. But, you know, there are – he's a very scheme process guy, right, Adam? McDaniel has set things up very nicely for him. They have really utilized their speed. They use a lot of motion to get guys open quickly. And then it's run after the catch stuff. So that's the system – that Tua really fits very well in, and he's he's in the right spot, um, certainly for his career, the way he plays the game. 
So that makes him dangerous. I mean, he led the NFL last year in passing yards. It wasn't Mahomes. It wasn't Josh Allen. It was Tua. So he is he's a very good quarterback. I don't think he's Josh Allen, but he's he's someone to be contended with. Sean McDermott has had answers against him. Yes. That, uh, you think early last season, remember they started um, at historic levels, uh, the 70 point game and all that, the numbers they were putting up and the yardage and the production. And then they show up in Buffalo. I think it was week four, mm-hmm. right? And and Sean McDermott dialed things in and really, uh, aside from early in the game, really slowed that offense down. He's, he's kind of had their number. And with the familiarity between these teams, now we talked last week before the Arizona game, you know, openers are kind of fluky and you, teams are figuring themselves out as much as they are each other. But there is a, a as a division opponent, you know, a, a lot of familiarity, and Sean touched on it this week, um, in terms of what to expect from each of these teams. How much does that play in, and how much does last year's template, do you think, that they had success with perhaps apply uh, in this game? Yeah, there's there's no doubt. There's great familiarity between the teams. Now, the, if you remember, that week four game, Miami had just scored 70 points against Denver. So there was a lot of talk about what, are, what were they going to do against the Bills? Can they keep it going? Think back, Adam. <laughs> that day, that was the day Tredavious White got hurt, but he played the first three quarters. Their secondary consisted of Tredavious White – I think it was Christian Benford on the other side, Micah Hyde, Jordan Poyer, Taron Johnson. Guess what? Four of those guys are gone mm-hmm. tomorrow night for tomorrow night's game. So that is a big concern for the Buffalo Bills. You know, losing Taron Johnson in the opener, that's massive. But you can make the argument that Matt Milano and Taron Johnson might be the two best players on defense. For what they do and what their responsibilities are, they might be the two best players the Bills have on that side of the ball. They're both not there anymore. Um, The safety tandem of Taylor Rapp and DeMar Hamlin, I mean, okay, they survived against the Cardinals. This is the test. Now we're going to see if these guys can actually hold up against a passing offense that really might be one of the most dangerous in the league. So, you know, you can look back at that week four game last year and what McDermott did, but he certainly had more more at his disposal to throw at Miami than he's going to have tomorrow night. And that's what I'd be looking for if I'm a Bills fan. Can he do it? Again? Can he do it again with the talent that he has left on the team? Now you think about the fact, uh, you know, who's gone and and at near the top of that list. And and Sean McDermott addressed it um, in his Tuesday news conference. You know, Jordan Poyer moving on to the Miami Dolphins and all that experience and 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 what he and both Micah Hyde uh, brought to this franchise during McDermott's tenure. So, uh, Taron Johnson went down very early in the Arizona game, right at the beginning of it. And they adjusted well with Cam Lewis. Uh, He stepped up. Look, the Cardinals, it's one thing with the offense that Kyler Murray and what they were bringing to the table to be able to adjust to that at home. But now, as you said, with the speed and the explosiveness and that we saw uh, against uh, the Jacksonville Jaguars and the Miami Dolphins as they rally and win on a last-second field goal, but we saw what they're capable of uh, in the passing game this is a very difficult to let's get into the X's and O's a little bit and how Buffalo now has to adjust uh, given the loss of Taron Johnson to deal specifically with that passing attack from Miami. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I think on the outside, Adam, um, you know, with Rasul Douglas and Christian Benford, I think the bills have a nice set of cornerbacks there. They did a great job against the Cardinals. You know, there was a lot of talk about Marvin Harrison jr. The number four overall pick big pick. Big, strong kid, fast, outstanding at Ohio State, completely invisible in this game. It didn't matter which side he went to. He could not do well. He got open on the one play. Everyone had video late in the game of him wide open down the field, and Murray didn't see him. But otherwise, he did nothing in the game. Greg Dorch, you know, decent enough receiver, um, did a little bit. But on the biggest play of the game, he didn't make the play against Jamarcus Ingram in the corner of the, you know, near the goal line there. So Arizona on the outside couldn't do anything, and I think a lot of that was because of Douglas and Benford. In this game, look, there's no doubt that those two guys are going to be tested heavily against with, with Waddle and Hill. What I'm going to be interested in is the middle of the field, right? Cam Lewis survived against whoever the Cardinals were trotting out there. I can't even remember. There was nobody that was you know, all that impressive playing out of the slot. The Dolphins have weapons all over the place that can take advantage of the middle of the field. I was looking uh, to a, actually did throw a lot of short passes 
last week. And then he lets those guys, he gets them into space, gets the ball in their hands, and they can make plays. It's going to be so important for the Bills to rally to the ball and, and you know, get the, get their hands on these guys before they get ahead of steam. That'll be the big thing. And Cam Lewis is on the spot here, Adam. He He's going to see all kinds of traffic. They're definitely going to attack him. You know darn well that Tyreek Hill is going to come in the slot and try to get matched up with Cam Lewis. So it's going to be humongous for him to play. And he played well last week, but he's going to have to play way better if they're going to survive against this passing offense. Just a quick note before we start talking about Allen and the Bills offense. Uh, The other aspect of this is the Miami running game, which is also extremely explosive. And as we record this, uh, there's an injury situation in that backfield that's being monitored very closely. Yeah, I mean, if uh, Devon a- I- Devon Aishin, is that a, a tough name? A-Chain? Yeah, he is one of the fastest running backs in the league. And last week they used him in the passing game. I think he had seven for seventy six yards. So he is a serious weapon to worry about. But I think he's got a. I think it's either an ankle injury. I think it's an ankle injury. He hasn't practiced yet, so we'll see. And Raheem Mostert also a very fast running back who last year, if you remember, early in that game he was killing the Bills in the game down in Miami. Um, He's a dangerous guy, too, and he's got a chest injury, I believe. So there's a possibility. I, I, I have a feeling that one of them, maybe both of them, will play. But I guess it's possible that they both might be out, too. That would be a nice break for the Bills. I'm not, I'm not even sure. I think it's Jeff Wilson is the next guy up for them. Um, I'd be far more interested in playing against Jeff Wilson than I would against A-Chain and, Mo- and Mostert. So, that's something to monitor up to kickoff on Thursday night. So it's a game where, and look, the, the the Bills scored 34 points in the opener. But it's a game where they're they're probably going to have to put up those types of numbers given the explosiveness of that Miami offense that we yeah. talked about. I, I, think, the, I, I think there's going to be many games this year, Adam, where the Bills are going to have to score some points. I, I don't think this defense is quite at the level that it's been, and this could be another one of those games where it, it could be a shootout. So – Given what we saw from Buffalo offensively, and they had balance in that game with the with the run and the pass, but I, I, I would not call Buffalo's passing attack in that game explosive. Josh yeah. Allen had to take a lot of that on his shoulders. We've talked about the new cast of receivers or whatever. We saw some some good things, but again, explosive is not a word that I would use to describe the Buffalo passing attack as they head for a game now on the road where they're going to have to put up some numbers, I think. Yeah, and let's face it, Miami's got some nice players in the secondary. I mean, Jalen Ramsey's one of the best corners in the league. Javon Holland, who turned that game around for Miami last week with that fumble, uh, that forced fumble, he, he is one of the best safeties in the league for sure. Um, there's They've got some guys back there. Now, the one, the one guy that I think the Bills are going to try to exploit, similar to Miami, they're going to go after the slot guy, Cater Cohort, or Co- what's his name? Cater Kohu, I think is his name, right? And they've had success against him in the past, too. They've targeted him a little bit in the past. That's the the area where you might see Curtis Samuel or Khalil Shakir come into the slot and try to take advantage of that matchup. But, yeah, Jalen Ramsey can lock up anybody. Um, He's locked up Stephon Diggs in the past going against him. So that's going to be a problem area for the Bills. They're going to need to work the middle of the field, similar to what Miami might have to do, and get their completions that way. And then, you know, Dalton Kincaid, Adam, um, you know, everyone yeah. talked about, yeah, he was perfectly fine with one catch for 11. All he wants to do is win. Hey, we all thought he was going to be the number one target in this offense this year. The passing game was going to go through him. The, the Bills can't be, can't, can't be having Dalton Kincaid catch one pass and only be targeted twice. That's got to change. So maybe we'll see some of that this week as well, getting him open down the seam and maybe take advantage of the middle of the field as well. Yeah, nine different receivers caught passes from Josh Allen uh, in that week one win over Arizona. But Dalton Kincaid, you would, you would expect uh, his production to really – they're going to need his production very much so, it's stating the obvious, to increase. So so that's kind of the look at the matchup on the field. There's, of course, a, a very significant story continuing to evolve off of it with the Tyreek Hill situation and the Miami-Dade police and and – I think you would agree. I mean, that 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 body cam video is extraordinarily disturbing. Um, and, and that situation is resolving off of the field. I want to touch on 
the way to a Tagovailo, we talked about leadership um, at halftime of their opener against the Jaguars and that impassioned speech, um, you know, with, with all of that having transpired just before the game. Um, and Joe Rose talked about this with us on Monday night. Those types of situations can help to galvanize a, a, a team early in the season. And I think you saw that in the second half, and you, you could very well see that in this matchup with Buffalo. Yeah, I mean, look, that, that situation was just absurd. I mean, I, you know, I, I'm not going to comment on, on the police, and they have a, they have a tough job to do, uh, and we understand that. And they're supposed to be protecting our communities, and they generally do a great job of it. But that was just an utterly absurd situation that it escalated the way it did. I mean, I'm not going to play the do you know who I am card, but for crying out loud, I mean, did, did they not realize that, all right, he is Tyree Kill of the Dolphins. He's going to the game. He might have been speedy. Maybe he was being a jerk in the car. He wasn't being a jerk when he got out of the car. He was trying to comply. I don't know what happened, but you just got to believe that the cops down there should have realized what was happening, who the guy was, and maybe just calm down, tell him, hey, don't go speeding through here and go on your merry way and go play your game. That just escalated beyond belief. Um, and that body cam footage, you're right, that is damning evidence those guys should be either suspended or fired for for the way they handled it even with Calais Campbell pulling over right. they were a complete jerk to him too he's trying to calm the situation down um, even telling them who who he is and right. yeah I, I and he winds up hand, he winds up handcuffed yeah I, it was just it beyond um yeah. I mean beyond disturbing the way that all went and and but now um in moving forward I mean, I, I, it's just something that that played in as Buffalo goes down there, and it, it's separate from the game itself. But I think it served as a, a something that helped to bring the Miami Dolphins yeah. together. And I think that that's still that process is still happening down there. Yeah, well. I mean, I think I think they like you said too at with the halftime speech, they were playing terrible. I mean, Jacksonville was was beating them up, and they the Jaguars should have gone up twenty four to seven late in the third quarter, that the Dolphins were on the way to losing. And you're right. I think they kind of did rally around the unfortunate situation. Um, but to be honest with you, Adam, I think that's behind the Dolphins now. I think they they did what they had to do on Sunday. They overcame a ugly situation off the field before the game. You're right. I think it did galvanize them. But I think they've probably moved on from it now. Yeah, in, in the community down there, the discussion will continue, obviously. But in terms of on the field Thursday night, I got to believe that that situation in the Miami locker room, at least, is put to bed, and it's all eyes focus forward, and right in front of them are the Buffalo Bills, who have owned them for the better part of seven years. So I think that situation has been resolved, at least in the locker room and on the field. All right. So again, as we record this uh, later or early this afternoon, you're going to be flying down there. Tell us quickly about your coverage and the run-up to the game. And then, of course, we'll be doing another edition of this uh, podcast right after tomorrow night. Yes. Yeah. I'll be down there, uh, going out tonight. I think we're going to, we're going to get together down there on the beach and maybe uh tip a few cocktails. We'll see. <laughs> Depends on if I get there on time or not. And then, uh, yeah, my usual coverage in the DNC, I'll have my, my game column. I'll have my report card. Uh, we do a live blog throughout the game, um, keeping you updated on everything that's happening. And then, uh, Either you and I are going to get together very, very early in the morning Thursday or maybe not quite so early in the morning Thursday before I fly out uh, back home. So we'll have to we'll have to see how that goes. Adam. I don't want to keep you up too late because oh, no. I know you're getting old, too. <laughs> I'll be I'll be wide awake. And I remember um, so many years, obviously, every year going down there. And I remember like usually to, to do our Monday night show, Sports Talk Live, I've got to be back as as early as possible. Sometimes I would fly back for an early game, you know, like a nine o'clock flight or something out of Miami International or whatever. But with the prime time games, you used to talk about burning the, the midnight oil and, and walking into the morning. I I would not go to sleep. Yeah. I would like, finish working for our morning show or whatever, return the rental car and just show up at the airport. Um, so that's that's from a from a kind of an inside media type perspective. That's what I've been used to with the Miami matchup. So I won't have any problem staying up, uh, yeah. waiting for you to finish writing. And, and we're, we're going to have, we want to have a show ready. The point is for, 
uh, Friday morning, obviously. I think what, I think what's funny, Adam, is you know fans watch the game, and then when it's over, they turn off the TV and they go to bed at eleven thirty at night. They don't realize, and I'm not complaining. Believe me, I am right, not no, complaining. Right. I love what I do, but you know, we're, we in the media are there, you know, three four hours after the game ends doing our work. So yeah, I'm going to be getting back to my hotel. Yeah probably around three or three 30 in the morning. So again, no tears being shed, no. but fans need to realize that they can just turn it off and go to bed. We are just getting started when the game right. ends. So yeah, right. our job night. actually starts, right. It's a labor of love, but the job starts when the game ends. All right. So travel safe. All right. I hope to not. That's right. never in my control. Everyone says travel <laughs> safe. That's never in my control, but I hope I travel successfully. How's that? Right. Get down there on time. And uh, listen, we'll be uh, talking to you after the game. Bills and Dolphins, Thursday night football from uh, Hard Rock Stadium. For Sal Mayorana, I am Adam Benini. Thanks for being with us here on Believe in Bills.